Via telephone, Nate Kane is a candidate for Congress, 2nd Congressional District. Nate, good morning. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. You're on with Rob and Bill. And before we get into some questions for you, give us the Nate Kane story. How did you get to this point in life? Well, I uh, moved to West Virginia two and a half years ago. And this was uh, right after, about two years prior to that, I had been embroiled in a whistleblowing uh, situation down in uh, down in Washington, D.C. I was working for the FBI. I've had a career in cybersecurity for the last 25 years. And uh, so some people may have heard of me before. Um, I was the Uranium One whistleblower uh, who blew the whistle on the FBI's cover-up of of the uh, Clinton scandal, and uh, particularly with relation to Uranium One and several other issues that I brought before the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Indeed. And, so, uh, and, and so tell us from that point how you end up moving to West Virginia. So after uh, blowing the whistle, I ended up, uh, we decided we didn't really feel safe uh, living in uh, in uh, Maryland anymore. Uh, our, my name got leaked to the press, and next thing you know, we had reporters at our house, and I had a couple of, of uh, close calls, and we decided it was time to move. Plus, with uh, COVID, all of the restrictions and lockdowns and everything that was going on, uh, I just didn't want to live somewhere where I didn't have all of my rights, including my Second Amendment right to defend myself, and I did not want to live somewhere uh, where you know, where people were not free. And so I looked around and I said, where is somewhere around here that uh, where people respect the, you know, the, the Bill of Rights and where you, know, you can live your life free as a free American? And I saw West Virginia it seemed to me to be the, be the place where we wanted to resettle and make our home permanently. So I had no intention or any plans of running for anything at that time. And it wasn't until uh, November, um, this last November, after the election, I was pretty disappointed in the results of what happened up in Pennsylvania and Arizona and some of the other states. And so I, I prayed about it, and I was mainly just praying and asking God to raise up righteous men and women to run for office. And I heard that still small voice in my head say, well, what about you? So my initial response was, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> and because uh, I did not want to do that, I actually have a very successful business, and I'm finally getting my life back in terms of you know, my anonymity and all of that. And this, of course, is going to destroy all of that. But uh, I spent some time in consideration and prayer and, and decided that um, what we need right now in our country is we need people who are going to have the boldness, the courage, the integrity to do the right thing and call out corruption and uh, try to fix some of these problems that we have in our federal government, uh, and especially in regards to uh, the overwhelming number, amount of power that is concentrated there uh, that, quite frankly, doesn't belong there. Um, I'm also very concerned about a lot of constitutional issues. So the three pillars that are really in my campaign are uh, restoring our rights under the Constitution and, and basically putting a check on, on uh, federal power. Um, the second one would be restoring or strengthening our national security. I feel like when you look and see what's happened in regard to just the depletion of our, you know, of our arms and our military uh, weapons and all of that being sent over to the Ukraine, including uh, the the draining of our strategic reserve, um, which is, I think, a pretty significant thing. I'm very concerned that that uh, we don't have what we need to fight a war on two fronts if that were to happen. And and then the last thing is, of course, our military. Our military strength right now is uh, is not great. Um, they are having a hard time recruiting, and I think a lot of it has to do with all of this woke indoctrination that they're putting pushing on our soldiers. I mean, who wants to place themselves under that? And then on top of it, you know, instead of training our soldiers to be, you know, really killers, because that's what we want them to do when we go to war, um, you know, they're they're you know indoctrinating them with all this sensitivity and gender training and all this nonsense. So um, those two things are so important because. The third part of my platform is really is opening the doors for prosperity in America, including, and of course, West Virginia. And without those first two things, any prosperity that you have uh, is going to be short-lived. So I have ideas on what we can do, and particularly within West Virginia. West Virginia is sitting on the largest oil, gas, and coal reserves, you know, in the in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, it really we are. 
we are here. West Virginia is the United States. What Saudi Arabia is to the Middle East. And uh, one person I talked to, one uh, constituent that I've gone around talking with, he said, we should all be sitting on gold toilet seats. I thought that was a pretty good expression. And uh, there's a lot that could be done here to revitalize industry and create uh, you know, long-term um, uh, jobs where we actually uh, control the supply chain. And that's really key. You know, a lot of these jobs that, that get created, especially in green energy, the big problem is, is all of the supply chain comes from China. Well, that's no good, especially if we end up in a trade war with China or if we end up in a war with them, which I, I hope to God we don't. But the reality is, is that if we're relying on them for our supply chain, those jobs will be gone. So we need jobs that are going to be relying on supply chain that we have in America. And what better than the resources that we actually have right here in West Virginia that are being pulled out of the ground? So I really see a, a vision of development of, um, of our, our energy, uh, our fossil fuel energy, and really energy independence and, uh, and building refineries and things that can take those products that are coming out of the ground and turn them into things that we can then turn around and sell. And so I've, I've got a lot of ideas about that and, and several other you know, domestic issues, but really the two most important things I think right now is our constitution and um, our, our national security. When you look at what, what the government has done, especially in regards to just violating and abusing our rights over and over and over, something has to be done about it. And, and, I, don't, uh, and I think we, we're off to a good start with the new Congress. Uh, they are, you know, holding hearings and they're talking about some of these things. But when you see that Twitter, you know, was was uh, being paid three, uh, three and a half million dollars by the FBI to suppress stories and to censor accounts, uh, that's clear interrupt, you know, clear interference with our, our freedom of speech. Uh, when you see, um, you know, the ATF uh, reaching in and saying, you know, hey, this gun that I just bought, you know, three months ago is now illegal simply because it has a Velcro, Velcro strap on. You know, on its, uh, it, it just makes no sense. You know, these people aren't elected. They're a bunch of, of unelected bureaucrats. And, and I don't believe that the Constitution affords them the right to tell us, uh, you know, what we can and cannot have in regards to guns. I think the Constitution is very clear um, that they shall not be infringed. I look at that. I look at the January 6th and what you see going on there is absolutely atrocious. It's an abomination of what is happening. In Washington, see, our founders would be rolling in their graves. You got people been sitting in jail for two years that has not even had a trial, and the Constitution affords us a right to a speedy trial and a right to bail, neither of which many of them have had the opportunity for. And I think that this is an issue that that you know the, the Congress needs to absolutely address. And, and as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if the Justice Department is not going to deal with it, then I think Congress needs to consider. An Article One tribunal under Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, they have the right to create a court specifically for certain situations. I think this is one that definitely would call for it. The last major issue that relates to that whole thing of constitutional rights is what happened during COVID. There is no call for what happened in terms of them telling people your livelihood is non-essential, so we're going to shut you down, but yet we're going to allow strip clubs and bars to stay open. It made no sense. It clearly, uh, we're also seeing, you know, information now coming out about the vaccine safety and the safety record and the fact that, you know, they skipped a whole lot of testing uh, that normally is done. Um, we're looking at things that, you know, clearly you're seeing that we're suppression of stories in regards to you know, whether or not this was from a wet market or it was a lab leak. And anytime anybody said anything about lab leak, it just got shut down um, by the media. And I think that they need, they need to look in to find out, you know, who was paying them to shut that down. Was it the drug companies? Was it the Chinese Communist Party? Or was it the NIH? We need to know. The American people need to know. And then people need to be held accountable. All right, uh, Nate, that was a lot. It was about, that was about 10 minutes to unpack there, so give us a moment here. Bill, you go yeah, ahead. Sir. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, there's a lot, as Rob said, a lot to unpack. I'm just going to push back on one issue, and that when you said that we sit on the largest oil, coal, and gas reserve anywhere in the world. That's perhaps true with gas, natural gas. It is not true with oil and coal. Being a geologist, I can speak to both of those. Uh, but 
much. Uh, you, uh, where in West Virginia did you uh, choose to locate two years ago? Is that in Berkeley County, Nate? Yes. Yeah, That's I live in Hedgesville. Live in Hedgesville. Okay, fine. You were in the Army for a while. What did you do in the Army? I was a uh, infor- uh, telecommunications computer operator maintainer, a 74 Golf. Um, basically, I was taught to operate the and, and maintain the top secret messaging switch. And uh, pretty much after I got out of school, uh, my A school, I went to uh, Korea for a one-year unaccompanied tour. And halfway through that tour, they decommissioned the, the piece of equipment I got trained on. So they said, well, you can either go back to school and train at something else, or, you know, we can uh, give you OJT. Mm-hmm. And so they trained me as a land uh, uh local area network uh, administrator, and uh, and then there were some opportunities to learn some other equipment uh, that was related to information assurance and, and, you know, cybersecurity is what it ended up becoming. And so I ended up kind of really getting into a, a career of cybersecurity, and it's, it's been a good one. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're bypassing the kind of the traditional way of running for office instead of running for a uh, state office uh, such as a uh, state senator, state, leg- uh, state uh, delegate. Uh, you jump into a, a congressional, U.S. congressional seat, running against a very, very well-known individual. Uh, what is your thought process of, of doing this, uh, skipping the, uh, the more traditional route, and also why are you, what are your chances are of taking on a formal candidate such as what you will be? Well, my thought process on this, um, this was not something that, that I had planned to do. Um, I had no desire to be a career politician. I'll just be right up front with you. Um, I would like to get in, make some changes, do some things, uh, hopefully inspire others to do the same, and and then get out and go back to you know private life. Um there is a, I think we have a problem in American politics. And what happens is people will get in, uh, they'll run for office, they'll go through like what you said, the traditional means of, and the whole, all the whole time, their goal is to get to the next step, is to get to the next level. And, it, and politics is treated like a career. Um, I don't believe that that was what was intended at the, the founding of our country. And I believe it leads to problems, especially with lobbyists and uh, with, with corruption. Uh, with our own Congress, I think it's why we see oftentimes legislation uh, that doesn't make any sense and doesn't seem to represent the people. So I would say that um, having somebody that comes in as a complete outsider, not a bad thing. A perfect example of that is Donald Trump. He certainly was an outsider. He was not somebody that, you know, was a congressman or, or a senator or anything like that. Um, he was not a governor. He just felt called to do it, and he did it. And he, I think he was one of the greatest presidents, at least in my lifetime, that I've ever seen. Um, a man who, who basically did everything he promised to do. And I think part of the reason for that was because he was not beholden to all of the special interest groups that uh, typically people get bogged down with, you know, when you're in politics. I have worked around Washington, D.C. enough to see just how um, that political system that we live in corrupts people. And so I think that the fact that I have no political background is actually a good thing. One of the things that you mentioned, uh, what, um, you know, going up a preventable candidate, um, uh, you know, how do I track with that? Well, the way I look at it is uh, I'm either going to get elected or I'm not. Um, I, I really, it's not an issue for me of, of uh, I'm not going to take, you know, lobby, uh, corporate lobby money. Um, I'm not going to go out and, and put myself in a position where I'm beholden to anybody except for the people of the second district of West Virginia. And so I am spending my uh, every evening, uh, every afternoon, every evening, and every weekend going out, knocking on doors, visiting meetings, talking to people in different parts of the second district. Um, I spent last week, we were in Charleston, but then after that, we went up to uh, Wetzel County and I met with some people up in Wetzel County. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of people here in West Virginia that feel, quite frankly, forgotten. They feel forgotten by, you know, those that go. Uh, to Washington, D.C. to represent them, but they also feel forgotten even a lot of times by their own delegates and senators. And I realize that's not a popular thing to say, you know, when I want to get their support. But to be honest with you, like I said, I don't really care about, you know, any of any politician's uh, endorsement. What I want is the endorsement of the people. And so I'm working my butt off to go out and talk to them, to listen to their needs, and, and giving them the assurance that what separates me from the other candidate is that 
while I may not be a very experienced person in politics, I have a track record of integrity and integrity when it counted. When I blew the whistle on, um, on the FBI, I went up against Hillary Clinton, I went up against the FBI, and I went up against Russian intelligence, intelligence agents. And even with all of that, and even you know, in throwing away the, the most uh, highest paid job I ever had in my life up to that point, uh, I turned away from it all to do the right thing. And I think that speaks a lot for my character and for my integrity. And I think that that the people of West Virginia will see that. And I think that uh, it, they'll see it, and I think it will matter to them. The people that I talk to, they seem to be, um, you know, very, they feel a lot, a lot of them feel very disenfranchised from, you know, from, uh, you know, what they, they see happening in politics today. I hear this term black pilled. I think a lot of people feel like, what's the point of voting? And I'm getting out there and talking to them and telling them, look, you know, we have to take action. We have to. We have a duty to. It's not a matter of whether we feel like, you know, we want to or not. This is something we've been given this great gift of America and having our freedoms, and we got to fight for them. Every generation has had to fight for them. Now, maybe we haven't had a world war in our generation, but we certainly have had a culture war in our generation, and we have to fight to make sure that our country stays free and that we can pass it to the next generation. And I think that I can inspire people. Uh, you let's circle back something you said earlier uh, the article one tribunal uh, uh, convened by uh, by the US Congress uh, has that ever and you I think you're specifically talking about those individuals that have been uh, uh, charged or held for January the 6th has a tribunal such as what you're describing ever been convened by the US Congress uh, there have been article one um, tribunals that have been uh, convened. There's a number of different types of courts that can be set. I mean, basically, they're just courts that are set up, but they're unlike a Article Three. my understanding, and, and granted, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a constitutional authority on this, so I am uh, speaking with people and getting information on this. But the difference between, say, an Article Three versus an Article One is Article Three. you have, you know, these are our typical courts that we see, the appellate courts and whatnot, where you have... Um, you essentially have a permanent appointment, and there's really nothing to do once it's creating to ever stop it. Whereas an Article I tribunal can be set up as kind of a temporary thing. Um, when you see a lot of the, the military tribunals, they, they work in the same way. Of course, uh, you know, the war crimes tribunals, um, Nuremberg, uh, Tokyo, which incidentally my great-grandfather, was, he testified in that trial. Um, he was a, uh, a survivor of the Bataan Death March in uh, the Philippines. And those, for those types of tribunals are very effective because what they allow is they allow for the Congress to basically reduce the salaries down to zero and these appointments not to be permanent. So that way you can make the court go away when it's done its job. And I do think that we have a situation here with the politicization of the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, that is pretty significant. And... Um, I don't believe that our current courts, I don't believe that the current Justice Department, um, you know, has the willpower to kind of clean up their own act. And so I think that this is something that could be appointed to address it and uh, and to bring in, um, you know, to, to basically uh, set this up to, to so, clean up this. So you're suggesting a congressional tribunal uh, to over, over, uh, provide oversight to the uh, to our courts for these particular hearings. Is that correct? Well, this would be an actual court set up in and of itself. It would be a temporary court, but it would be a, a court to try um, the, the essentially abuses of power and crimes that have been committed uh, by those that have been in positions of power, especially when you think about uh, some of the things that are coming out now um, about uh, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, I think there have been plenty of evidence that Fauci lied to the Congress, uh, that he lied to the American people and misled them. Uh, it seems clear that there was uh, a lot of money involved that was going into the hands of companies that were essentially funding gain-of-function research uh, in China that you know, essentially weaponized a, uh, a virus that we gave them. Uh, I think that is something that needs to be looked at. And I'm not calling for you know torches and, and pitchforks. I'm talking about a judicial process by which to uh, to to try these crimes and 
and uh, to look into them be, and, and not just look into them, but actually hold accountability. Because we see it all the time. Congress will hold hearings, but then nothing happens. And I think that, that we actually need to see, I think the American people need to see accountability. Otherwise, they're not going to believe that it's ever going to happen. I think congressional hearings, by and large, are the biggest waste of money that, that we have in Washington, D.C. And that's saying something because there's a lot to compete with there on biggest waste of money categories. But they have these hearings and whatever what comes of them other than a bunch of time spent and a few a few powerless underlings getting the worst of it after the investigation's done. Uh, hey, uh, we're just about out of time, uh, Nate, here. But I, if you could in a minute or two. Uh, take me back to November 19, 2018, and tell me what it's like to be in your home when the FBI raids you. Wow. Well, you had to go there. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, that was the scariest moment of my life, I think, maybe except for when I actually um, you know, brought the documents out of the FBI. When the FBI showed up at my house, I kind of expected it, but you know, they, they came in. It wasn't like a kick-your-door-down um, Roger Stone style of raid. Uh, it was more of like a Mar-a-Lago type of raid. They knocked at the door. Um, you know, they, they showed me their badges. They asked if they'd come in and talk. Um, I, I let them in. You know, I told them that I was a protected whistleblower under the ICWA. And, and much to my lawyer's chagrin, I told them everything. I had nothing to hide. Um, but, you know, but they, of course, then issued their search warrant. And then that's when things kind of got scary because I realized, oh, wow, you know, this is not just a friendly conversation. And, uh, and they, you know, they basically detained me, uh, you know, in my living room on my couch, uh, you know, for, shoot, seemed like forever, but I think it was, uh, you know, like nine hours or something like that. They basically went around my house room to room without me being there, uh, going through all of our stuff. They took all of our electronics. In fact, I just got all of those electronics back. Um, shoot, I think it was three weeks ago. That's how long it took, you know, for, for this whole thing to just kind of like, you know, eventually, because they don't ever tell you when they're done investigating you. Um, you know, they just let it hang over your head. And so you have to live your life in fear, wondering if you're going to be indicted for something that, you know, you didn't do. And so, but I had them going around my house. Um, and they, my son, who's got autism, uh, he was very negatively affected by this. It really uh, created a, um, I, I think a lot of, of kind of PTSD for him actually seeing his father have all of, you know, I had, I've got several guns and, and then I had them locked up in the safe, but you know, the FBI asked to see my guns. They took all of my guns. They zip tied them all and separated me from them. And uh, of course my son saw that and he felt immediately unsafe seeing all of these agents with guns on their hips, you know, and yet, um, you know, me, I'm being separated from mine and, uh, the other thing that was, uh, I think, a scary thing was, you know, really afterwards, because um, one of the agents really came down hard on me and really tried to um, manipulate me into giving them passwords and things like that. And and he gave, you know, while I gave him the password to my phone, which I probably shouldn't have, and I would never recommend anybody do that, um, he started asking me for, and I'd already told them that I had an attorney representing me. But he called me the next day and tried to pressure me to give him the passwords to government equipment that he had taken. And that would have been illegal for me to do. So I told him, I said, look, uh, here's the name of the system administrator. You can call them over to the VA because I was working. At that time, I had left the FBI and started working for the VA. And I said, you can contact them and get, you know, get that. And, and he kept pressuring me and kept saying, no, I need you to give it to me. And, and I told him, I said, I won't do that respectfully. I, I can't. That, that would be... I don't believe that would be legal, and I'm not going to do it. And, and then that's when that's when things changed, and, and it got real ugly. And at, when they raided you, you had already turned documents over peacefully, basically, correct? Oh yes, yes. So I, I had we had contacted uh, Horowitz. I gave them, um, and we asked Horowitz, "Do you want the thumb drive?" Because I had everything initially on a thumb drive, and um, and he said no. He said he wanted everything printed out, and I was authorized to keep that thumb drive because if the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence decided to do nothing, I actually had the right to go to, the, say, the Senate Judiciary or the House Judiciary. There were other options that I had to take this information to, and so I had the thumb drive in my possession at my home. Um, you know, it was... Uh, uh, secured, and what happened was I, I'm certain that I was being surveilled because my lawyer called me, and you know, uh, 
I think a few months had passed and uh, from, from when we, you know, kind of did our thing. And he contacted me and called me and said, hey, um, you know, and he gave us always, whenever he's talking on the phone, he gave the spiel about, you know, uh, this is a confidential, uh, you know, conversation, attorney client privilege, blah, 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 before we could talk on the phone, just in case anybody was listening. But he said, he said, uh, hey, we need to get that thumb drive, you know, kind of out of your house and then to safer, you know, to a safer place. And literally, I think it was like maybe a day or two later, that's when the FBI raided me. So they were clearly listening to me and surveilling me. Um, I'm pretty certain based on some information that I have that I don't really want to get into, that I had a, a FISA uh, warrant, uh, you know, on me for possibly up to two years, even after it came out that I was a whistleblower. I'm very disturbed by that. Um, that, that you know, to me, that seems like a complete violation of my civil rights. And then, it, yet at the same time, it's like, how do you prove that? Because of all the way that, you know, they have secret courts and everything. Nate, so... I got to jump in because we, we've gone over time by about five minutes and uh, that, that puts me behind schedule a little bit. But we'd love to have you back on again before the election, sir. Thank you so much. I would appreciate that. That would be great. And then uh, have a good day. I appreciate your time today.